I um, open the meeting and welcome everyone to the fourth meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2018. I can remind members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent. The first item on the agenda is a decision on taking business in private. I would invite members to indicate whether they agree to take item four on our agenda today, which relates to correspondence from the Equalities and Human Rights Committee in private. Do members agree to consider this item in private? Okay, thank you very much. If we can then move to our second agenda item, which is the consideration of a new petition. Petition 1679 on cycle helmets in Scotland was lodged by Jenny Lockhart. The petition calls for the introduction of legislation on a national information campaign to ensure people wear helmets when cycling in Scotland. The petition collected 83 signatures and received 16 comments. The briefing prepared for us notes that the comments received in the petition broadly reflect the two sides of the argument in terms of cycling safety, particularly with regard to the wearing of helmets. The petitioner has indicated to the clerks that, as there is not general support for the action called for, she wishes to withdraw the petition. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Michelle? I'm happy to go with the petitioner's suggestion that it's withdrawn. I think the evidence that we received back indicates that there is... is really no need to pursue it. Agreed. Yes, mm. I think we should close. I think probably there was strong views on either side, I think that it would be fair to say, but there wasn't it was clear that, you know, there was quite a compelling case on, on both sides of the argument. Um but obviously as the petitioner wants to withdraw, we think we would um accept that and agree to, to close the petition on that basis. And we can write and, and thank and of course remind her too that it's possible to um, resubmit a petition at any time. Okay. In that case, if we can move on to the next petition um, on our agenda this morning, which is petition 1458, which calls for the introduction of a register of interest for members of Scotland's judiciary. As members will recall, we have previously agreed to write to the Lord President and Cabinet Secretary for Justice and have considered a draft letter at previous meetings. This is a petition that has received much consideration since it was lodged in 2012, and I would like to express my gratitude to the petitioner for raising the issue and to all those who have engaged in discussions on the issues raised in the petition, including both the Lord President, Lord Carloway, and his predecessor, Lord Gill. During the course of consideration of the petition, positive developments have occurred, most notably the introduction and further development of a register of judicial recusals. The register brings welcome transparency to instances where a judge may decide or be requested to decline to hear a particular case. The committee particularly welcomes the recent agreement of the Lord President to expand the information captured in this register. The core action request by the petition, however, was the establishment of a register of financial interests. We have given much thought to this request, hearing views both for and against such a register. Having taken these arguments into account, the committee has concluded that a register of financial interests is not unworkable and it's the view of the committee that such a register should be introduced. In reaching this view, the committee is very clear that it does not consider there to be a basis for any suggestion of corruption in respect of Scotland's judiciary or of inappropriate influences on judicial decision making. Rather, it is the view that we have reached based on the principles of transparency and openness in public life. While this is the view of the committee, we also understand that the Lord President and the Scottish Government have both indicated that they do not support the introduction of a register. And I wonder if we think it should be appropriate for us to invite the Justice Committee to consider the petition in light of our recommendation. And I wonder if members are content to write to the Lord President and the Scottish Government setting out our view and to refer the petition to the Justice Committee for its consideration. And I wonder if members have any comments. Angus? Yeah, uh, thanks, Convener. Um, clearly, this is another uh, long-running petition which has been live since December 2012, um, for as long as I've been on the, the, the committee. And it's, it's, it was originally based on a, a, a similar move in New Zealand, um, which was subsequently withdrawn. Um, I, along with a wide range of backbenchers, uh, spoke in favour of the introduction of a register of interest at the time um, during a chamber, debate in the, a cha chamber debate in the, the previous session, uh, and that support from backbenchers was from across the, the political spectrum. Um, so it's clear to me that we need to ensure transparency and openness in public life, as well as ensuring confidence in those holding public office and personally. Um, and clearly it's not the, the view of the, 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 the committee, but I believe a, a register of interests along the lines of the system operating in Norway, which, which I've looked at, uh, is the way to go. However, I'm aware that the committee uh, as a whole hasn't uh, taken a view on that. Um, 
of course, convener, the, the petition is already secured a result, as you've referred to, uh, with the introduction of a register of recusals, uh, which was brought into effect in April 2014, uh, directly as, as a result of this petition. So the petitioner has uh, got a result already. Uh, and that also, as you've referred to the current Lord President, uh, Lord Carroll, who's agreed to extend the scope of the register of recusals. Um, Personally, I'd have been seen, keen to, to see the Scottish Government and the Judicial Office for Scotland do some further work on the introduction of a register of financial interests. Um, however, as you've uh, suggested, uh, is possibly the way forward. Uh, in the first instance, I think we should refer the petition to the Justice Committee to allow them to hopefully move the issue forward. Okay. Anyone else? Rona? Yes. I just broadly agree with um, what my colleague has said. I think... Um, I think that's the natural way forward for this petition. I don't think we can we can actually take it any further, given that the history that we've just heard. So um, I would be I think it's a sensible um, decision to send it to the Justice Committee for their consideration. Is that agreed? Agreed. Okay. In that case, we are agreeing to write to the Lord President, Scottish Government, setting out our view, and to refer the petition to the Justice Committee for its <coughs> consideration. Okay. Excellent, thank you. If we can then move on to the next petition, which is Petition 1548 by Beth Morrison, on national guidance on restraint and seclusion in schools. Included within our meeting papers are submissions from the Deputy First Minister and the petitioner. In his submission, the Deputy First Minister addresses the committee's question about whether, as part of the forthcoming review of the Holding Safely document, he might consider whether that would be the most appropriate place for the inclusion of the new guidance on de-escalation and physical intervention. The new guidance included Engaged and Involved, Part 2, a positive approach to preventing and managing school exclusions, is referred to as IEI2. The Deputy First Minister refers to feedback that he has received which suggests that the Holding Safely guidance is still well used within the sector and notes that it is just one part of a wider trauma-informed approach. In her submission, the petitioner provides a list of bullet points to demonstrate the feedback she has received on IEI2 from parents and carers across Scotland. This feedback appears to suggest that there are still a number of concerns about the guidance. The petitioner contrasts IEI2 to the consultation run recently by the UK government. She says that this is, quote, much more like the guidance she would like to have seen in Scotland. She considers that it is, quote, very clear and specific and was written by bespoke experts in the field of restraint and seclusion. She appears to suggest that the degree of understanding about the use of restraint among professionals elsewhere in the UK is more advanced than it is in Scotland and expresses her disappointment that the Scottish Government does not appear to see merit in updating the Holding Safely document. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Michelle? Um, I was a wee bit disappointed with the uh, Cabinet Secretary's response. Um, sorry, OK. Um, and I think the petitioner makes some very good points around the work that's being done. Um, I think this is a moving field. It's a field um, where research and advances in thought process um, are ongoing. Um, and I think we, we should go back to the Cabinet Secretary and ask him to look at what the petitioner has said and respond to that. Okay, Rona. Yeah, I, I think you know. I, I think we we definitely need to to get a response from the Deputy First Minister, given the um, petitioner's um, comments, and also we should try and find out roughly when the, the UK government's um, analysis, the publication of that, will be, um, so we can get an idea of timescales. But I, I think I, I think that there, there are more things to be drilled down here, and I think definitely a response from the deputy first minister would be called for. Okay, Brian. I, 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 what strikes me, uh, um, convener, is the, the or what I'd like to get an understanding of is the, the the knowledge of our educators or the education of our educators um, around uh, this field. Because the more evidence I've heard from this and, and from the petitioner themselves, it seems to me that there, there's a potential gap there in the education system of our educators um, and I think that uh, I certainly would like to, to hear a little bit more from the uh, Scottish Government, the Cabinet Secretary specifically um, in, in that arena how, how is it dealt with in uh, uh, the training uh, of our educators is, yes. it part of the, is it part of the, the curriculum? Yes 
Yes, it would be interesting to know. I don't know whether I can't recall whether we've spoken to um, organisations representing education staff in the past about what their training actually involves and whether that's progressed, whether it's updated, the extent to which, <coughs> if schools, for example, are, are up to complement terms of staffing, it's probably, you know, there'll be well trained people there, but if there are pressures inside the school, you wonder. And um, what the consequences of that are, but maybe in writing to the Deputy First Minister, we can start there and maybe see what comes from that if people are agreed. But I think we would be concerned that clearly the, there has been, <clears throat> if I remember historically, there's been quite a lot of work with the petition and a lot of positive comments that she's made about engagement with the Scottish Government. And I think if she's still troubled by that gap, it's something that's ex worth exploring further. So if that's agreed, um, we would write to the Deputy First Minister seeking his views on the most recent submission from the petitioner, um, and specifically around feedback on, on um, IEI2 and um, about the UK government consultation and maybe get some details and timescale for that. OK, thank you very much for that. If that we can then move on, I'm going to move on, um, I'm to miss out the next one just now and go on to... Uh, petition 1640, and we will come back to 1619. Oh, my apologies. So, ignore all of that. Um, sorry. Do you want to miss both of these? My apologies. If we can deal with petition 1642, um, and we will come back to the other two, as we have a member um, who has an interest in both of these who would hope to attend. So the next petition I want us to consider is petition 1642 by Norma Austin Hart on the sale and marketing of energy drinks to under 16s. The committee last considered this petition on 21st September. At this meeting, we agreed to write to the Scottish Government to clarify how its commitment to limit the marketing of products high in fat, sugar or salt are set out in the Scottish Government's programme for government 2017-18 related to energy drinks. The Scottish Government submission states that energy drinks and other products high in caffeine are not included in this commitment, but recognise that they often contain high levels of sugar and, as such, may inform its new diet and obesity strategy. The committee also asked the Scottish Government to what extent has encouraged other initiatives in the restriction of the sale of energy drinks in premises such as that taken in relation to centres run by Edinburgh Leisure. The Scottish Government responded by stating that while specific instances are a matter for individual local authorities, ministers would be happy to support the policy of restricting the sale of energy drinks in these premises. In response, the petitioner expressed disappointment that no legislation was currently planned in relation to the sale of caffeinated energy drinks. She welcomed the support demonstrated by the Scottish Government, but questioned whether this would happen in practice. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? OK. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm of, the, of the opinion that uh, <coughs> just by by banning something doesn't necess isn't necessarily the most effective way. It, it, it forms part of a solution. Um, I would be quite interested to understand how the Scottish Government would support such a ban of a sale. Uh, I think, you know, th in practical terms, how you're going to implement a policy. And how are you going to back up a policy? I'd be quite interested to see how, as they say, they, say they, would, they would support it. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to understand what that actually means, how you would support that policy. Mm. But, uh, I think there's, uh, with, with the diet obesity strategy currently uh, in, the, in, the, in the offing, it'd be really interesting to see what comes out of that in support of something like this. And, and, and you know, this idea of. Um, my my personal opinion is that uh, we should, uh, if we could change people's attitude towards this, we could change, you know, the, the food producers' uh, attitudes as well. I'm I'm kind of um, sitting on the fence on in terms of should you be. Mean, you think it's consumer led. That, that, I would that, like that the business will follow the <coughs> the views of the consumer rather than the business shaping the views. I think of the I think I think there's both sides of that. I think I, I think you need both. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't fall on one side or the other. I think we, in, in this place, we seem to be tempted to fall on, on the side of yeah, trying to change the attitudes of the food producers without the other, without the other side of that that uh, uh, argument being being dealt with. But you know, as I said, there's a diet obesity strategy in the offing, 
Mm -hmm. um, so I think it would be interesting to see what comes out of that. But in the meantime, I'd quite like to understand what the Scottish Government mean by supporting the initiatives and how they would support that initiative. Okay. Are others agreed with that? Then else to add? Rona? So I mean, the, the, the government. I mean, I, I agree with what Brian says, and often, you know, when I'm talking about a ban, it's enforcing it that's that's the problem. But there's a the government has confirmed in the response it, it's encouraging the use of existing powers by local authorities to restrict the sale of marketing of energy drinks to children in leisure centres and other public um, arenas. And, you know, it, it's just it's just how far can it go in, in that respect? But I think with the new um, diet and obesity strategy about to be published, well, published imminently, um, we should see what that, we should see what that uh, contains and then take it further and see. But um, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. Right. Just, just to add. I mean, th th I think there are there are things, uh, th th you know, positive steps you could do. I mean, one of the things that always strikes me, if you ever walk through a hospital, you know, there's the vending machines, <laughs> with and, and a lot of the a lot of the, t the time it's the worst possible things you could possibly <laughs> have in there. And these are things you could we could, you know, in this place directly influence. Mm. Uh, and I think when we're talking about a ban, you know. Uh, those are the things that actually positively we could we could enforce. I would, you know, I know this is the petitioner's one, but I'd be quite interested to see mm -hmm. in the diet obesity strategy whether that will be, you know, okay. spread out to a, a wider. Michelle. Um, yes, I mean I I agree with uh, Brian Whittle. I think that the the problem with banning is it's identifying everything then that has a high caffeine content. Um, it becomes quite complicated, um, and you know, rather like alcohol young people, if, if, if sales are banned, they'll just get somebody else to buy it. So it doesn't actually stop consumption. In fact, it almost makes consumption attractive because, you know, it's, it's, it's breaking a rule, or stretching a boundary. Um, I think what we do need is, is some understanding or better understanding and guidance for people that, so that they understand these energy drinks can be harmful, particularly to young people. Mm. Um, and I definitely think we should be talking about whether or not it's appropriate to be selling them in, in public um, arenas, particularly areas like health centres, mm -hmm. you know, and activity centres, hospitals. Um, so I think this is more about guidance. It's more about um, public opinion and change and culture change and getting people to understand that uh, the best way to have good energy is not to pump yourself full of caffeine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, I would favour an approach rather than a ban. Um, and much more public awareness and using our influences, as Mr Whittle says, on on actually the areas where we do have control and uh, um, we can recommend. And certainly some of the work we did around alcohol and young people, um, you know, we did encourage shops not to ca carry certain lines and they took proactive steps to do that. Um, and I think we should be doing the same. Okay. Angus? Um, Nothing much to add, convener. Just to say that uh, clearly more information would be would be welcome. Um, um, the diet and obesity strategy isn't due to be published until summer this summer, so um, we've got a wee bit, or well, not too long to wait, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, to get more detail from that. Um, but I'd be interested to know if there's been any similar moves in other parts of Europe to ban. Um, energy drinks uh, to under 16s. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we have that information in, a, in our briefing. You can maybe ask um, Spice for that information. I'm, I'm also quite... I mean, I think we're agreeing that um, we wait for the, the strategy to be published and see what's referred to in there and maybe seek some information from them how they would support um, policy banning from public premises. I mean, I, it can be done. I mean, when I started teaching routinely, you would have vending machines and all sorts of things sold in schools and tuck shops, and I just don't think that happens anymore. Um, and, and we also have to acknowledge that there can be displacement, so you don't sell it in a school to get it elsewhere, but my own view is you don't make good the enemy of excellence. You might not be able to do everything, but you might be able to do some just yeah. by um, a combination of the, of the two things that have been suggested. So I think if we can agree that we are um, seeking to defer the consideration of the petition until the strategy is that strategy is published and perhaps ask ministers how they particularly would support um, a policy of banning um, these kind of drinks in publicly funded premises. There is a broader question about 
public education. I wonder if that might be coming through the dietary and obesity strategy as well. Can you describe like, it's banning sale of or, or provision of? Because it will be very difficult for them to ban them from public places, so people can, yes, you know, will bring them in. Yeah, so it's me. provision yeah, and sale not of. Quite, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not mm. been ch checking the bags as they come in. Um, <laughs> step too far even for me. Um, okay. Um, in that case, can we move back to um, petition one six one nine on access to continuous uh, glucose monitoring? And can I welcome Emma Harper? MSP to the committee for consideration of this petition and the next one. Um, the next, so we're going to consider petition 1619 by Stuart Knox on access to continuous glucose monitoring. We last considered this petition on 21st September and agreed to invite the petitioner to make a written submission in light of the Scottish Government's most recent submission and to invite the Scottish Government to provide evidence at a future meeting. Members may wish to note that a response is yet to be received from the petitioner. Members may also wish to note that Miles Briggs MSP has recently asked two parliamentary questions in relation to funding for continuous glucose monitoring and insulin pumps. Clare Hawkey MSP has also recently asked the Scottish Government to provide an update on the rollout of monitors across NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and NHS Lanarkshire. Responses to these parliamentary questions are included in our meeting papers and I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Yeah, I think actually, um, even more recently than that, um, Finley Carson asked the First Minister's yeah. questions last week, didn't he? Yeah. I think, uh, I think there's, the, the, there's the welcome move that um, the, the, I think the, I'm right, the Cabinet Secretary has um, made it to, uh, uh, available to all health boards. Uh, however, the uptake of that um, is very patchy. Some, some um, health boards are now... Um, uh, giving uh, uh, giving those uh, type type one uh, the, the constant glucose monitoring uh, apparatus, but others are not, um, and uh, I'm really interested to understand what the decision making process is around why some are doing it and, and some aren't. Because um, from the evidence that we took, it's not a financial one, because uh, the cost the co the monthly cost I think. If, if, if if I'm, if I'm correct, and we did it down in the, the south of Scotland, the cost of replacing what they currently use uh, in terms of the, 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 the pinprick um, and blood uh, it, um, sort of test compared to the cost of constant glucose monitoring on a monthly basis, there wasn't that much of a difference. So I'd be really interested to understand why certain health boards are not up, are not taking up the, the, the opportunity to, to give out constant glucose monitoring apparatus. Mm -hmm. Michelle? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm actually hugely frustrated by this, if, I, if I'm perfectly honest. I mean, it, it, did, it does feel like this is something we should not be dragging our heels on, that it makes an enormous difference to, to the individuals who are suffering from type 1 diabetes, and it will ultimately make an enormous difference to the NHS, because there's a huge saving to be made in, in costs down, downstream by having a much more stable population of, of diabetes sufferers. Um, Mr Whittle referred to the fact that um, there isn't a differential in cost. I think one of the things that, as a committee, we perhaps need to take evidence on and need to understand is the underpinning cost. Because certainly um, when we met with um, some sufferers and, and a pharmacist gave us um, some details of the differential in cost and it appeared that there wasn't much. However, when we met with a consultant, he indicated the opposite and said there was a significant difference in cost. Um, and I think this is something as a committee we, we need to understand. In terms of the funding that's been given, absolutely it's welcome. But one of the... the bits of evidence that, that came forward when we were meeting with all the um, individuals is that actually the funding that is currently allocated means that the consultants are having to make choices about who gets it and who doesn't. And the consultant indicated that that's a very difficult choice to make because all the patients were equally deserving. Um, and there certainly has been an extremely slow rollout of this, despite the funding being there. Um, and I think that is extremely worrying, because it could be making a huge difference to people's lives. And again, I think we need to understand why that funding isn't getting to the front line and supplying the, the, the monitoring systems for people. 
Um, but you know, I I I do feel that the the drip drip feed of this is frustrating, and I think we need to get under the numbers for this because um, some of the implication seems to be that it's a money issue. But I don't really understand at this point in time whether in fact it really is a money issue <laughs> or, or whether it's it's there's a lack of will just to say let's crack on and get on with this. Um, so I, I would like some more information around that and I'd like to really get some evidence around that. Okay, Angus? Yeah, uh, thanks Camille. I would agree uh, with Michelle Valentine there. I'm, I'm at a loss to understand why uh, flash glucose devices haven't been rolled out more quickly. Um, given that uh, the £10 million was allocated, albeit um, the money was to be staggered. Um, but, I mean, when you look at the figures, um, Dumfries and Galloway only have four funded uh, CGMs. Forth Valley in my own area have only four. Um, and I know I've had people at my surgeries who, who are paying for it themselves uh, at uh, approximately, I think the figure's about £1,500 a year. Um, so, yeah, we, we definitely need more information as to why there has been this delay, given that the money has been allocated. I agree with, with everything that's been said. I mean, it's just clouded in confusion. It's clearly, a, it's clearly a good initiative heading in the right direction, but for some reason it's just uh, not clear exactly uh, what the, the picture is. Um, I, I would like to hear from the petitioner. Um, I know that they haven't responded yet, so I'd like to hear... Um, from them, um, and then and then really try and get into, as we've said, you know, just what's what's going on behind the figures and the and the delays. Um, yeah. Current sign guidelines um, for diabetes type one management are dated two thousand and ten, and so that's eight years ago, and the technology has just totally steamrolled forward, but the guidance I think needs to allow for the complexity of type 1 management and it's not even just type 1s we heard from a type 2 person who lost seven stone in weight when he used the abbott libra to gain um, a better understanding of his glycemic control and carbohydrate intake and he only used it for like a fortnight figured out his diet and then stopped so you know, so it benefits type ones and type twos, and my issue is also paediatrics. We took evidence at uh, the cross party group for diabetes, which Brian Whittle and I are both members of, and I'm co-convener of, that um, kids that have seizure activity at night because of low blood sugar really do benefit from continuous glucose monitoring or flash monitoring. So there's different ways that blood sugar can be managed, and to save these non-verbal two-year-olds from multiple finger sticks as well as being woken up at night to check blood sugar it affects the kids as well as the parents and uh, you know i have constituents as well as everybody else that have one child in particular has seizure activity because of the just the up and down blood glucose control so i welcome a proper analysis of the costing um, I've used the Abbott Libra myself. I've been using it on and off. Um, I'm a pump user myself, so I am firmly engaged with the technology and how do we make it work for the, the wider population that could benefit from it. I think, you know, Emma and I, uh, Harper and I both sit on the uh, Health and Sport Committee as well, and I think one of the things that's, that, that, that's crossing into this for me is the... the, the, the reticence for adoption of new technology into the health services seems to be a real drag uh, and, uh, and and perhaps I don't know whether or not there's, 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 there's the potential here uh, uh, to, to sort of, sort of cross-reference that, that particular bit of evidence that's been taken in the Health and Sport Committee because it does seem to me that there's no medical reason there doesn't seem to be a financial reason although I would be really interested to, 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 to have that evidence um, which leaves this reticence of this, or this drag in the adoption of technology. I think there's the, it, it certainly has opening up uh, a whole raft of, of, of questions for me. Yeah. I, I was quite curious when, when in some of the events it said, you know, we, we must remember this is a clinical decision. Well, I would have thought if it, on a clinical decision making that's to, to achieve a better stability and monitoring is a bit of a no-brainer from a clinical decision, particularly, uh, as Emma Harper says, in, in young non-verbal children. 
Um, so, uh, you know, the, some Im the implications seem to imply that, well, you know, the reason they're not being rolled out is because the clinical decision is otherwise. And, you know, I think, what, you know, what my colleague is suggesting there potentially is we need to get under that because I, I, I fail to understand why doctors would say, no, we, we would prefer to just do finger pricking. That, that just makes no sense. Uh -huh. Doing that, it would be worthwhile um, trying mm -hmm. to um, establish that. I wonder if we can agree that we would write to all the NHS boards um, to ask for information, really to pick up the point that Brian made mm -hmm. about the rollout of CGM in light of the funding provided by the Scottish Government. You know, so why is it patchy and try and get a sense from um, each board what, mm -hmm. what they're doing, how far advanced they are. The consultant um, indicated when we spoke to him that the money hadn't been released by the actual health board down to the consultants. Right. So, so well I that, think we well need to specifically ask that So there's that an question. issue about money mm. coming from the Scottish Government into the health boards and then for health boards deploying it appropriately yeah. and to get a sense from them of mm -hmm. the the value of it, I mean, in comparison with each, you know, as opposed to pinprick, that would be useful to know, mm -hmm. Emma. NHS in Fries and Galloway, when I wrote to them, they said that they were going to review in August the use of continuous glucose monitoring or flash monitoring. So that's welcome but again you know the technology is out there and it could be tested in a maybe a, in a, a better more constructive way and I think that uh, I would welcome any forward approach to looking at uh, a more constructive way to get CGM available for people. I think maybe we could also to, to sign to ask about um, an update on their review of their own of their own guidelines would be useful. Also to write to Scottish Government, I think we would want to take evidence from the Scottish Government in this, or from the relevant minister, I think that would be useful. And obviously um, we would welcome a, a, a response from the petitioner, but we appreciate that there may be circumstances which means that they're not able to do that. But if they were, if he was able to respond, that would, we would welcome that. And we find the petition that he has brought forward really interesting. There's loads of issues here and we can certainly take them forward even if he's not able to respond. But if he were able to, that would be... Excellent too. So I think we've we've identified quite a number of actions there. Is there anything else? No, in that case, if that's agreed, we can move on then to petition one six four zero, action against irresponsible dog breeding, which was lodged by Eileen Bryant. We've received a written submission from the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, in which she indicates that she'd be happy to give evidence to the committee. The Cabinet Secretary indicates a range of discussions that are ongoing between officials. This includes official level discussions among all UK administrations relating to DEFRA's draft legislation on animal licensing, which is proposed for introduction in England and Wales this year. She adds that there have been discussions between the UK and the Republic of Ireland in terms of sharing intelligence about illegal imports and other discussions for a coordinated public awareness campaign. The Cabinet Secretary draws attention to the Scottish Government's commitment to animal welfare issues, including licensing and registration arrangements in its current programme for government. She advises that key stakeholders and enforcement agencies have been in contact in preparation to amend the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006, which she indicates will, quote, increase the maximum penalty for the most serious cruelty offences to five years imprisonment, as well as allowing fixed penalty notices for lesser offences. She states that there will not be any retrospective powers within that legislation and it will not relate to any court proceedings commenced prior to the date of enactment. In November 2017, the Scottish Government published its report on the research it commissioned into tackling the illegal trade of puppies from a supply and demand context. The Cabinet Secretary states that she launched this report at an event in Edinburgh at which she gave the opening address. Links to the Scottish Government's report and the subsequent briefing published by the Scottish SPCA have been provided in our meetings papers. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? I, I think there has been significant progress made um, in this in, with the, this petition. Um, certainly, uh, obviously, I'm now aware of this because of the petition. But in, in, certainly within Parliament, there's been an awful lot of. of um, I know in, in Harper's led quite a lot on this as well. Also, with uh, um, we, we had the, the organisations within the Parliament and speaking to them and how they are dealing with the, the import of, of uh, puppies, specifically through Cairn Ryan, actually. Um, they seem to be suggesting they're becoming more successful. I'm, 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 I certainly think the way forward uh, in this one is, is to uh, inform the public in terms of where they purchase 
uh, butters or poppies, but uh, um, I think there's been significant uh, progress in this particular one. I'd be quite interested to hear what the Cabinet Secretary had to say on that one and, and, and maybe yeah, more information. It certainly felt a very positive and detailed response from the Cabinet Secretary, so mm. it would be worth, mm. I think, hearing in, in more detail from her. And that in itself, of course, informs yeah. the public debate. Yeah. Angus? Um, just to agree, um, it, it's good that the Cabinet Secretary is uh, happy to come in and, and uh, give us some more details, so uh, we should take it up on the offer and, and look forward to that. Okay. Emma? Um, I contacted Eileen Bryant, who submitted the petition ahead of today, and she obviously is keen to continue looking at how puppies are uh, purchased as well. And just on Monday, I was at Edinburgh Dog and Cat's home for a meeting with uh, different uh, stakeholders, SSPCA, Kennel Club, One Kind, DEFRA, RSPCA were also there, and Trade and Standards from Dumfries and Galloway. So there is a lot of work being um, done. The 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 government uh, officials talked about a, like a national program of uh, awareness. So either a short video is in process of being uh, developed, so that will help engage people about the best way to obtain a puppy. There's other work. Um, you know, we've had a couple of debates. We've had uh, contact with COSLA. Um, we've had puppies in Parliament just to raise awareness. And uh, Holyrood Dog of the Year is the second, uh, second Holyrood Dog of the Year will be this year again. So I'll be sponsoring that. The first one? It was, uh, <laughs> it was My Dog Maya won the first one. So, so it was Holyrood it instead of Holyrood. So. <laughs> but we'll be doing uh, Holyrood Dog of the Year again this year. And uh, that will also raise awareness of uh, issues around puppy traffic. And um, at the meeting on Monday, it was described that... Uh, all routes from Europe seem to have been closed for illegal uh, transfer of puppies, except Romania. So a lot of work has been done by um, DEFRA and the people in the Dover borders. Um, Cairn Ryan seems to have become more uh, covert in the way puppies are brought in, um, but Operation Delphin has been quite successful. And uh, But it seems like different ways are, are, are being explored for bringing dogs in from either Southern Ireland through the north and then through Cairn Ryan. So there's obviously still a lot of work that could be done, but uh, from the canine conference last year, I think it in enabled everybody to work together from all the different agencies, which is really good to see, um, especially when we're talking about, you know, the RSPCA, S SPCA and one kind and everything. A trusted breeders scheme is being developed, which is similar to the trusted traders scheme that Dumfries and Galloway Council developed, which um, which means that there will be like a national database of uh, trusted breeders where people can then go to and see these are the best um, people to go get a puppy from. And third party sales has been looked at. The banning of third party sales has been looked at by Michael Gove in, uh, in Westminster. So it might be that we can continue to pursue other options of disrupting and uh, deterring the illegal breeding and then illegal trade in puppies. Okay, thanks very much for that. I think that um, we have agreed there has been progress. We are uh, grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for her response, but we'd welcome the opportunity um, for her to give us give evidence. And we would also invite the petitioner to provide a further submission if she wanted to do so. Okay, if that's agreed then, thank you very much and thank you Emma for your attendance for these two petitions. If we can now move on to petition 1645 by James Ward on the review of legal aid in Scotland. We last considered this petition on 21st September 2017. At that meeting we agreed to write to the Scottish Government on the issue of Scottish Minister's discretionary powers under the Legal Aid Scotland Act 1986. The Scottish Government indicates that decisions on whether to exercise the power is done on a case-by-case -case basis, but identifies two factors that are generally taken into account. These are to determine whether using the power is necessary to protect the ECHR rights, and if the creation of new proceedings and legislation has created a temporary gap, which needs to be filled pending amendment of existing, regu of existing regulations. The Scottish Government cites examples from 2016 and 2010, and notes that on each of these occasions that determination was followed by secondary legislation. It also sets out in some detail the process 
and factors taken into account, including the public interest in the Scottish Minister's use of the discretionary power in relation to the Glasgow Bin Lorry case. The Scottish Government indicates that while the number of determinations made this year is expected to be low, it is, quote, considering how best to ensure that information about its discretionary powers is made more widely available. In its submission, the Law Society of Scotland indicates its agreement that the discretionary power should be used relatively rarely. The Law Society states that it has engaged regularly with the Independent Strategic Review of Legal Aid and indicates that, in its written response to that review, it expanded on challenges identified in its own strategy paper, including simplification, scope, technology and delivery. The Independent Strategic Review of Legal Aid indicates its call for evidence, which was issued to more than 150 stakeholders across the justice spectrum, drew a range of very effective responses. It notes that the chair of the review is due to report to ministers by the end of February. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. <clears throat> well, Michelle? it's actually quite a complex um, petition. Obviously, it has, has lots of facets around how it works. Um, I think, you know, I certainly welcome that there is, is an independent review underway and that hopefully has reported now. Um, and I think in the light of that, we should write to the Scottish Government um, and ask basically what they're going to do uh, you know, in terms of the recommendations that the review may or may not have brought forward. And that will give us the, the basis on, on how we then move forward on this petition. I Forgive me, but I think I'm right in thinking that the petition, uh, the review was uh, published the 9th of March. Right, so we've got the date, have we? Yes, 9th of March. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so I think if we write now to the Scottish Government, they will they will hopefully be reviewing it and looking at what's in there. And what we need to know is, is what is it recommended and what do the Scottish Government intend to do? And then okay. we can revisit the petition accordingly. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brian? At, at some point, we would, be, we would be considering bringing in, you know, a representative from the Law Society to... To speak to them with that, with, uh, well, sure. we wait to see what the recommendations are because it may be that they're very straightforward and we would end up maybe getting into a loop of yeah. evidence taken that's not going to take us terribly far. But if we can look at the, okay. the review and, and we can make a judgment as a committee then whether we want to take it further still. Is that agreed? Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. In that case, we can move on to the next petition which is Petition 1655 on Scotland's National Senior Carriers, lodged by Christine Metcalf on behalf of Avich and Kilcrenan Community Council. We previously considered this petition on 14 September 2017, where we took evidence from the petitioner and agreed to write to the Scottish Government, Scottish Natural Heritage and COSLA. The written submissions have been received and included in our meeting papers. The Scottish Government states there is no plans to review the process for designating or the, on, or the extent of national senior carriers in Scotland. In response to the committee's question about how or whether its policy on wind farms affects its position with regard to national senior carriers, the Scottish Government states that its policy is to support the deployment of onshore wind while protecting the environment. It adds in response to the suggestion that the Parliament be regularly updated on the cumulative impact of wind farms that it considers that this is not something which could be quote, readily or meaningfully quantified as a national impact for reporting purposes. Scottish Natural Heritage acknowledges some of the issues raised by the petition, including that the current suite of 40 national scenic areas remains the same as originally designated. It acknowledges that NSAs represent an important natural asset for Scotland, but notes that one purpose of the designation is, quote, intended to manage landscape change, not prohibit development. It considers that reviewing or revisiting the existing suite of NSAs is not a priority at the present time. In their first submission and response, the petitioners expressed their surprise at the Scottish Government's position. They argue that to use an energy policy as a reason for not to review the current process for designating NSAs is irrelevant, particularly as pressure on the landscape from wind farms, quote, would not have been envisioned in the 1970s. The petitioners consider that Scottish Natural Heritage's ability to fulfil its task in this context has been seriously weakened and indicate that they believe there is much to be gained in terms of economic, environmental and social benefits by having more NSAs and national parks. In their more recent submission, the petitioners refer to a report by Mountaineering Scotland, which they consider demonstrates how visitor numbers have fallen in the areas that host wind farms. The petitioners suggest that it is difficult to have an entirely accurate idea of the number and impact of wind power developments in Scottish national scenic areas, 
but consider that the UK Government's Renewable Energy Planning Database provides a good insight. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? I, I, I represent an area where there's quite a, a heavy proliferation of of, uh, of of wind farms and and, uh, and a, there's, there's not a surgery goes past when uh, where I, I don't have some kind of representation on on that proliferation. And I think you know you know the, the last one I had was was it looks like New Cumberland is actually going to be completely surrounded. <laughs> is by one for so, I have a lot of sympathy for uh, what the petitioner is saying around uh, NSAs, um, uh, and I should state obviously I'm not against against wind farms, but I think that that uh, they do have uh, have uh, a, a point here in that uh, they, they they do seem to be taking over a lot of the of the of the countryside and. Uh, I, I I would I would suggest that uh, yeah I, I know I know there's, there's there's a suggestion that we might close this petition but I, I would I would rather it was kept alive perhaps not in this committee but maybe in in the local government committee uh, in, in communities committee in its scrutiny of the the, the planning bill. Um, Are we not conflating two issues, which is somebody's concern about um, the. The proliferation of wind farms with what are the purpose of national scenic areas and one is seen as a means by which you stop the other which i'm not sure no. that, I, I mean it's, it's no, like it might be a convenient that. thing to argue but presumably national scenic areas have a an existence in their own right not simply as a way of managing our energy policy no, and, and, and i think i think that that's that's the bit that, that, that uh, concerns me and that if it's a national scenic area um that uh, that's taken into consideration so the argument, so the argument with the petitioner is, if you make it a national scenic area, you protect yourself from wind farms. Now, I think no. there is an issue about cumulative effect of any planning development, which I would hope the planning legislation would look at. Again, Michelle, as an ex-member of a, a planning committee that was constantly faced with these issues, I have to say it is a very emotive issue, um, and I think one of the problems is, is even the existence of an NSA. Um, you can have a wind farm erected on the edge of it and the argument would be that it affects it but because it's not in the NSA so I think it is it is a massively complicated argument and in a way it does conflate it when you, when you talk about them side by side um, I mean I think the the submission we've had back is is very clear they're not going to review NSAs and, and the number of NSAs um, I think the issue here is really about how planning the planning strategy fits and how it all fits together. Um, that is currently under review at the moment anyway. It's, it's it, you know, the new planning, planning strategy is going through. Um, and I think this probably needs to feed into that as, as part of the conversation. I'm not sure here in this committee that, that we can do a lot more around this now. I think it does need to go into that conversation. Um, it needs to be part of that review. Um, there is you know, a huge lobby in terms of protecting our scenic areas um, and Scottish National Heritage obviously play a big part in that. Um, but as always, all these things have to be in balance with everything else. Um, and, you know, quite often the lobbies take one position and they're not worrying about the wider overall strategy, if you like. So I think it needs to go into that pot of looking at the wider strategy. I don't think us looking at it in, in, in a single um, track, if you like, is going to get very far. So I, I would be in favour of referring the petition to the Local Government and Communities Committee um, and, and add it to their scrutiny of the planning bill going through and for them to look at it. I mean, if they then want to refer it back to us at some point, that that will be their choice. But at this stage in the game, I think it belongs over there as part of that discussion. I think if I'm right, there's only one way traffic with petitions. <laughs> send it back to us. Well, the uh, petitioner can always re-petition us. But, absolutely, uh, absolutely. but I think that's where it belongs mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Angus? Yeah, I think it's clear from the government's response um, that there's no appetite to increase NSAs or even uh, national parks. Um, and I would have been minded to close the petition uh, simply on that basis, uh, given the government seems to be digging their heels in. 
Um, but um, if if the, if it's the uh, overall view of the committee that um, it should be referred to the local government and communities committee, then uh, uh, I'd be happy to go along with that. Runa? I think we should we should close it because of the the government's stated quite clear stated view, and also SNH don't consider a review to be a priority as well, so they're not adding weight to the petitioners' um, call. And I mean, I think if the petitioner is aware that the planning review is going on and that they could have some input to that. Um, I think that's that's as much as we can do, and I'm I'm not particularly I'm not particularly keen on, on actually moving this petition elsewhere. I think it should be closed. What? One second. So it's um, you know if we do refer it to local government communities committee, it may well be closed down by them uh, fairly quickly as well. So. But it may be that at least they would flag up as an issue within the planning legislation because I think that a, that a, as I said already, my sense is. People's frustrations about wind farm development and talking about any any extending NSAs as a way of dealing with a separate problem, which is about what do we do about cumulative effect of wind farm. I mean, I don't. I mean, I think there is always a balance. As somebody whose family came from uh, remote communities, something that creates economic opportunity and stability um, for these communities, in my view, is to be welcomed. But that will always be traded off against people who want. They want the wild to remain the wild. They're not living in the wild. They're not living in remote communities. But some are, of course. But I think there's always that tension about what what do we what do we put in the land? What what is human made on the land that changes the landscape, changes other things, but makes it those sustainable communities of people living them. And there is a tension there, which I absolutely recognise, and it's actually interesting that people within the community who are flagging this up and feel it has an impact on them. So I feel that. Um, <clears throat> I don't think we can go any further on it. I think there is an issue. The only problem with taking it to the local government communities committee, we should um, be clear that they have gone past the stage one consideration of the bill. So the ability to influence the stage one report is ended. Um, I have no doubt these issues will be flagged up in stage two. Our only view will be, is it helpful, <coughs> I think, to the consideration of the issue to at least allow local government communities committee to have to have a sight of it and aware that this is an issue. I suspect this is an issue they'll be aware of anyway, but will it reinforce that this is something that communities themselves are wrestling with and that they are concerned? And I, and I hear, I mean, I was a planning minister for a short while, and the whole question of cumulative impact of wind farms in the area that you represent, Brian, was something that's flagged up to me, but also, for example, Open Cast Co. And there was a big tension within communities at that time in terms of trading off jobs against what was happening to the landscape. So these are things that we're, we're alive to. I suppose as a committee, I don't personally think we can deal with the issues um, further, but the, really the judgment is to be sent it to the local government committee or not. Yeah. Brian? Do, I do hear what, what, what uh, Rona and Angus say here, but I, th I think that it can do no harm, and if they're already aware, it, 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 it disappears. But uh, if it reinforces or informs uh, what, what they're currently looking at just now, I don't see why we wouldn't, at, at the very least, pa pass it on to them. Michelle? Yeah, and, and I have to say, you know, when we, we developed our supplementary guidance around wind farms, it was rejected, and we were told no, and, and we had to change it. Um, you know, the government didn't accept our position as a local authority on it. Um, so I think in, in terms of information, it does no harm to fully inform the, the uh, local government and communities committee mm -hmm. of, of the kind of things that are coming through in other directions on this mm -hmm. because it is quite a as i say it's an emotive subject it's it causes quite a lot of division and i think you know it does mm -hmm. no harm to add to the information that's received it is also another interest tension i think between strategic national goals and how they are then delivered at a local level so I you think know, it's those about of us who are in favor of renewable energy there kind of comes a point where these things have to go somewhere and then there's a judgment call about how that is then But I think that, that's about um, also about what people consider fair share, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you yeah. know, it's, uh, I think there's quite a lot of tension around, okay, we accept, uh, you know, policy of renewable energy, we accept that, you know, again, but why should, should one area get a, a large proportion of that, um, destroying what people consider to be the, 
the sort of intrinsic benefits and, and beauty of where they live already. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, there are lots of issues around it. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, I think, you know, the more information people have in front of them, then, uh, you know, when, it, when decisions are made, mm -hmm. it can't be said that we ignored the commentary. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think there's any reflection in the seriousness with which the petitioners mm -hmm. made their case. You can understand why at a local community level they have flagged this issue up. Can we agree then that we're going to refer the petition to the local government and communities committee? We can obviously provide them with the deliberations we've had so far on that. Is that agreed? Okay, in that case. And obviously we would want to thank the petitioners um, for um, the work they've done in making the petition um, clear to us. And obviously they have the opportunity to, to submit a further petition and indeed engage with the planning legislation as it goes through if they, if they choose to do so. Okay, if we can now move on to the next petition for consideration, which is petition 1659 by Bill Tate and the Local Authority Complaints Body. The committee last considered this petition is meeting on 21st September and agreed to write to a range of stakeholders, including the Scottish Government, the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman, Citizens Advice Scotland, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, COSLA, the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives and Senior Managers and the Scottish Independence Advocacy Alliance. From the responses received, there was no support for the action being called for in the petition. Written submissions also responded to concerns raised by the petitioner that the SPSO was not effective as they remit its procedure and not the facts of the case. Both Solace and the SPSO themselves confirmed that the SPSO does not consider disputes about the facts of the case and therefore what the petitioner seeks already exists. The petitioner clarified in his written submission that he seeks the creation of a new body with a proper remit to replace the SPSO or a major overhaul of the SPSO to make it fit for purpose. The petitioner remains of the view that there is a postcode lottery with regard to local authority complaints and that there needs to be a set of rules of procedure that all councils must follow. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Angus? Um, well, I certainly welcome your clarification with regard to the, the remit of the SPSO. Um, I think a lot of people are confused if they're not happy with a, a decision that's taken by a local authority. They, 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 they kind of half expect the SPSO to be able to overturn that decision, which uh, clearly isn't the case. Um, it would seem that um, you know the Scottish Government, from its written submission, is uh, satisfied that the SPSO is, is operating uh, satisfactorily. Um, so. There's basically no support for uh, what the petitioner is asking for, and I would therefore move that the petition be closed. Okay. Any other comments, Rona? Uh, yes, I, I, I agree with uh, my colleague. I, I, I don't. There is no support. Um, the E uh, H R C, you know, is uh, pointing at a number of um, uh, views that about why it, it just wouldn't be feasible to do this. It's, Quality legislation largely reserved to Westminster. Um, Scottish Parliament wouldn't have the power to introduce the the, the new uh, the new body that he's suggesting. So I I don't I just don't see it, that it can go any further. To be honest, it's not got support. Okay, Michelle. Yeah, I, I think looking at the data and the SPSO's um, information on how how they've dealt with complaints outcomes. I mean, clearly the, there is a process and clearly people um, who, who make complaints are get, some of them are getting upheld, quite a lot of them are upheld. Um, there's been a lot of recommendations. So, that, so there is clearly a system there. Um, it seems that, you know, in what again are very emotive cases generally, inevitably some people are, are not going to be satisfied with the outcome um, and will never be satisfied with the outcome. But from the evidence we've got in front of us, there is a system there, there is a process for people to go through, and I can't see any any evidence that suggests we need to, to look at creating something new. Um, and I think, it, unfortunately, it's just going to be one of those things where you can't please all of the people all of the time. Thank you. So um, I think we're agreed that we want to close the petition under Rule 15.7 of standing orders on the basis that there's no support for the action called for in the petition. But again, we'd want to thank the petitioner for engaging with the committee and flagging up an issue you know, about 
the way in which public systems take people's complaints seriously, and I think that is in itself very often a challenge for public organisations, so we can thank him for that. If we can now move on to the next petition, which is Petition 1660 by Bill Tate on Scottish Legal Complaints Commission Review, and Petition 1661 by Melanie Collins on reform of regulation of the legal profession in Scotland. Members will recall at our meeting on 21st September, we agreed to join these petitions together for future consideration on the basis that they raise similar issues. I should indicate that Alec Neal, MSP, who has an interest um, in these petitions, has submitted his apologies as he's attending the Public Audit Committee. Um, at the meeting on 21st September, we also agreed to write the Scottish Government, the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission, the Law Society of Scotland, the Faculty of Advocates, the Scottish Solicitors Discipline Tribunal, Citizens Advice Scotland, and the Judicial Complaints Reviewer. Responses have been from, from a number of bodies, and we have also received a submission from the Chair of the Independent Review of the Regulation of Legal Services. Responses are included in our meeting papers. Both petitioners have also provided written submissions in response to the submissions received, and this information is summarised in our briefing note. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Okay. Michelle? I think this is a situation where um, we can welcome the fact there's an independent review underway, okay. which is, I suppose, in the end, what, what perhaps everybody would want um, in the light of the petition. So. Um, I suggest that uh, we can, I, I think, possibly defer it until we have the results of the review and we can satisfy ourselves that the, the petitioner's concerns have been answered through the independent review. Angus? Yeah, I would agree, Convener. Um, clearly, the, the responses from the petitioners, uh, Bill Teat and Melanie Collins, are, are very interesting. Um, and uh, a review of the regulation of legal services is ongoing as Michelle Ballantyne said, so, uh, and its remit covers the asks of both the petitioners, so uh, I'm, I think we should defer it uh, until we receive um, the findings of the, re the review. Is that agreed? agreed? Okay, in that case, we're agreeing to defer further consideration of petitions until after the findings of the review of the, reg of the regulation of legal services are published and uh, recognise the progress that's been made on the petition. Okay, if we can then move on to the next petition, which is Petition 1663 by Leslie Wallace on Driven Grouse Shooting Study. We last considered this petition on 21st September and agreed to write Scottish Government and Scottish Natural Heritage. Both submissions received refer to research that has been commissioned by the Scottish Government into the economic and biodiversity impacts of large shooting estates in Scotland. It is understood that the impact of driven grouse shooting is a specific focus of this research. In response, the petitioner's written submission highlights a range of issues that he believes exist with regard to current moorland management and driven grouse shooting practices. I wonder if members have comments or suggestions for action. Angus? Yeah, convener, thanks. Um, the petitioner's a, a constituent of mine and I've discussed the petition on a couple of occasions with him. Um, I, I think what Les Wallace, Wallace is asking for uh, in the petition is being covered by the Scottish Government's research into the economic and biodiversity impacts of large shooting estates in Scotland. Um, I think it's planned to be a wide-ranging research which will look at the potential impacts of game shooting as well as possible alternative land uses for large uh, shooting estates, uh, which will hopefully address the issues uh, the petitioner has with regard to current moorland management and driven grouse shooting, grouse shooting practices. Um, and of course, there's the independent group set up by the, the Cabinet Secretary uh, and led by Professor Alan uh, Verity, which is tasked uh, to look at the environmental impact of grouse, grouse moor management practices, uh, which will recommend op options for regulation, uh, including licensing um, and other measures uh, which could hopefully be put in place without primary legislation. So uh, I think we, we can close the petition, given it's been successful, uh, to to date, mm -hmm. uh, whether by coincidence or design, oh, absolutely uh, by design. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, pleased to pleased to see the government uh, taking these issues on board. Okay. Any other views? No, mm -hmm. Okay. So um, we agree <coughs> to the suggestion that we close the petition under Rule Fifteen Seven of Standing Orders on the basis that the Scottish Government has commissioned research to explore the economic impacts of large shooting estates with a particular focus on driven grouse shooting and recognising the progress that has, has come with the petition. 
and we would want to thank the petitioner for the engagement with the committee and recognise the, what has been achieved through the submission of his petition itself. Okay, in that case, if we can move on to the next petitioner <coughs> agenda, which is petition 1665 by Mark McCabe on common law of blasphemy. We last considered this petition on 21st of September and agreed to write the Scottish Government to ask for their views on the current law on blasphemy and whether there are any plans to amend this law. In its written submission, the Scottish Government confirms it has no plans at this time formally to abolish the offence. However, the Government highlights the review of hate crime legislation, which includes crimes motivated by religious hatred, currently being undertaken by Lord Brackadale. The Government intends to consider whether the law in this area requires to be amended in light of the findings of the review. The petitioner's written response states that the submissions received, submission received from the Scottish Government repeats what he has already been told and the point of his petition remains unchanged. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Rona? I think we should defer it until we... Um as the, the Lord Brackadale's review, hate review uh, legislation is um, published. Um, I think it would be premature to, to do anything um, before that because we, we need to see what that actually says and then and take it from there. So I, I would I would favour deferring it until Lord Brackadale's review is published. Okay, other views? Yeah, I, 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 I would support Ron Mackay's position. I think um, I have some empathy um, on the fact that you know, it perhaps should be abolished. Um, it has been everywhere else. Um, so I think, yes, we wait until Lord Brackdale has reported and see what he says and then take it from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think we again have agreement that we would defer further consideration of the petition until after the conclusion of the review of hate crime legislation by Lord Brackdale and we can then um, consider the petition in light of, of those recommendations. Okay, in that case, if we can move on to the next petition for consideration, which is petition 1666 by Ian Davidson on Scottish Parliament Electoral Cycle. The committee last considered this petition on the 21st of September 2017 and agreed to seek the Scottish Government's views on the action called for in the petition. The Scottish Government states that a change in date for the UK Parliament election could, in theory, allow the Scottish Parliament and Scottish local authorities councils to revert to four-year four terms without there now being a clash of election in 2020. However, it does not think that such a change is appropriate. The government also comments that the next Scottish local elections will fall on the same day as the next UK general election. The government notes that power exists for the Scottish Parliament to vary the date of the next local, Scottish local elections and that it will monitor the coincidence of elections and discuss with relevant stakeholders any necessary action to avoid a clash. The petitioner has indicated that he has responded to a Scottish Government consultation on the elections and is content to see what formal proposals emerge from this process. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I th Michelle? <clears throat> I think we should uh, close the petition. I think the petitioner seems to be content with the, pro you know, the process that's now taking place. Um, I think in, in many ways, I think as we said before, I think when we considered this, you know, elections can change at the drop of a hat, so you can keep moving them and you still wouldn't necessarily get the outcome you wanted. So I, I suggest at this stage we just close it. Mm -hmm. Okay, other views? Uh -huh. Okay, in that case, we're agreeing um, to close the petition under Rule 157 of Standing Orders on the basis that the petitioner has responded to the Scottish Government's consultation on electoral reform and has indicated that he's happy to see what proposals emerge as a result of that process. And again, we would want to thank the petitioner for highlighting these issues and afford the opportunity for them um, to be given a public airing. And you know, obviously he has the opportunity to um, observe what comes out of that consultation. And if he wants to submit a further petition at any stage, he's obviously free to do so. I'd want to thank him for his engagement with the petitions committee. If we can now move on to the penultimate petition for consideration today, which is petition 1667 by W. Hunter Watson, a review of mental health and incapacity legislation. The committee last considered this petition on 21st of September and agreed to write the Scottish Government, the Mental Welfare Commission and the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Responses have been received, as has a submission from the petitioner. The submissions draw attention to commitments have been made to review the Adults with Incapacity Act to reflect the requirements of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the inclusion of learning disability and autism within the Mental Health Act. Beyond this work, both the Mental Welfare Commission and the Scottish Human Rights Commission appear to be supportive of a wider review of mental health legislation. 
The Minister for Mental Health has also highlighted these reviews and that the 2015 Mental Health Act promotes supported decision-making. The Minister considers that it would be inappropriate to consider wider changes to legislation until these key pieces of work have reached conclusions. In his response, the petitioner highlights work undertaken in respect of the 2016 legislation on mental health. The petitioner considers that it is desirable that a wide review be carried out at the earliest possible opportunity. He concludes by drawing attention to a recommendation from the Law Commission for England and Wales, which calls for a single legislative scheme regarding non-consensual care or treatment of both physical and mental disorders, whereby such care or treatment may only be given if the person <coughs> lacks the capacity to consent. Members may also wish to note that the petitioner has also drawn our attention to parliamentary questions lodged by Miles Briggs MSP and the responses that have been received. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? I'm, I'm mind to um, write to the Minister for Mental Health just to clarify the sort of timescales from conclusion of that piece of work. Um, and at that point, we can maybe consider whether or not we invite, we invite uh, the Minister in. But uh, I think at the moment, with that piece of work outstanding, um, that's, that's where I would go. Okay. Angus? I would agree as the way forward at the moment. Um, we can consider inviting the Minister for Mental Health back into uh, the committee at some point in the future. Yeah. So we would write in the meantime checking timescales for the piece of work that she's highlighted, um, which she yes, herself has indicated would, um, would have to be concluded before there was any consideration of legislation, and that we would look at to uh, invite the Minister for Mental Health to provide oral evidence to the committee at the appropriate time, and that can be in discussion with her office, if that's agreed. agreed. Okay, in that case, thank you for that. If we can move on then to the final petition for consideration today, which is petition 1669 by Will Bill Welsh on Independent Vaccine Safety Commission. The committee last considered this petition on 21st September and agreed to write to the Scottish Government, the Joint Committee on Vaccines and Immunisation and Health Protection Scotland. A response was received from the Scottish Government and clarifies that medical safety, medicine safety, sorry, including vaccine safety, is reserved to the UK Parliament and is monitored by the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. The Scottish Government therefore has no plans to set up an independent vaccine safety commission. The Scottish Government also raises concerns about the research which formed the basis of the petition, stating that the European Medicines Agency concluded that, quote, the study had methodological flaws and did not provide evidence that the quality or safety of these vaccines is compromised in any way. The petitioner states that the research has been peer-reviewed and remains of the view that in light of this research, the vaccination programme, quote, must be suspended until all vaccines can be shown to be free from contamination and safe, and it's imperative that an independent vaccine safety commission be formed. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Michelle? Yeah, I, I think, um, to be honest, we should just close this petition. Um, I mean, it's quite clear from, from our papers and from the evidence in front of us that um, Scotland is not in a position to have its own medicine safety agency, I think. Um, and it's quite appropriate that it's done through the e e UK and at the moment, obviously, in conjunction with the EU and the guidance from there. So I don't really feel there's anywhere for this petition to go now. Okay. Angus? Well, for me, convener, clearly it's a uh, frustration that uh, these matters are reserved, but <laughs> <laughs> um, however, I, uh, <laughs> however um, I do see, uh, I don't see the merit in, in continuing this this petition based on the salient fact that, uh, that the, the issue is reserved and we have no power over it in Scotland. Mm. But it's also a question whether the evidence leads us to the conclusion the petitioner arrives at. Anyway, I mean, I think there's an issue about the safety of vaccines and confidence in vaccines and necessity of vaccine. And I'm not sure if you would stop a vaccine program, you know, on the off chance that there might be a problem with it. I think there are there are big issues, as we've known over the years, with with vaccines and confidence in vaccines. And the consequence of a loss of confidence. Yeah, well, it was clear with the vaccine. measles when people pulled out of having measles mm -hmm. vaccine, and we we promptly got a huge spike mm -hmm. in so measles and the consequences of measles, which are quite severe for young children. So, mm -hmm. I think I would be 
very nervous about disrupting what has been an incredibly successful um, modern technology in terms of vaccination. Brian? Mm -hmm. I've had, you know, considering the case where you know, vaccines have gone wrong uh, and I've had a, a, a bad outcome, but, but I think I agree with the rest, the rest of the, my colleagues here that to pull a, a, a vaccination programme on based on one or two cases would be would be folly, but uh, and I don't think there'll be any other option to but to close the petition. Okay, I think I think your regardless of some of the more um, sort of the, the 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 more detail we've gone into in this, but the, the fundamental issue is has been identified by um, Angus and others that medicine safety is a reserved matter, and therefore the Scottish government is no remit to set up an independent vaccine safety commission on that basis. We're agreeing to close the petition. Is that agreed? Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, we have previously agreed to consider the final two items on our agenda today in private, and so I suspend the meeting to allow us to move into private session.